Um, okay, so I'm continuing in Proverbs 31. Uh, I didn't get to finish that last week. So hopefully last week was a blessing to you. Um, obviously that sermon sparked a bit of discussion. Um, I don't know whether the remaining is as controversial, but uh, hopefully you learn something from this chapter as well and see, see a bit of insight into this virtuous woman. Um, all right, so we'll continue on. Uh, I don't know how long it'll take me to get through the rest of the verses, but hopefully not too long. So let's keep going at uh, verse 13. We got to verse uh, 12 uh, last week. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Talking about that the, hus- the heart of the husband is able to trust in uh, his wife if she's a, a virtuous woman. So let's go on to verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. So a couple of thoughts on this verse is if you see like she's seeking wool and flax and what are these? These are raw materials, right? So when I think of her seeking wool and flax and then making things of these and obviously here she is like, you know, turning it into clothing and whatnot. But I think of women that work and make things from scratch, like they make things from raw materials, whether it is, you know, making clothing like the virtuous woman we're reading here. But what I think of is, you know, making things from scratch in terms of food. Uh, you know, making things from raw materials, making them from scratch, and therefore they're usually healthier and fresher. I mean, Michael and I were just talking out soul winning today. Um, we were talking about the use of garlic, and I was like, well, what about like a garlic extract? And he's like, well, you know, because you might lose some enzymes or something like that, you know, when you extract it and keep it. You might have some of the properties there, but generally when things are made fresh and they're made from raw materials, they're a lot healthier for you. And this is one thing the virtuous woman is looking out for, I'd say, is that the, the health of her family. And it's even like that with juices, you know. They say, you know, you can, you can take supplementation and things like that, and that helps. But a lot of people get really healthy and get really good from, you know, juicing fresh fruits and vegetables because there's something about eating something fresh that's made just then, drinking it within a couple of minutes. Then there is even, you know, they say juicing it and keeping it in the fridge for a couple of days. You lose some of those enzymes as it begins to oxidize. And, you know, like I remember when and Elizabeth, was, uh, you know, when Elizabeth and I were starting out and, you know, when you first get married, you know, you start off just buying things from the shop and things like that, just buying things that are ready made. And then when she started making things from scratch, it started to amaze me sometimes how simple uh, things were to make that you would regularly buy from the store. Like some things you wouldn't even think about, like mayonnaise. You know, if you want like mayonnaise for your sandwich or mayonnaise from your burger, generally you'd just go to the store, right, and just buy mayonnaise. You'd never think about actually making it. I mean, back then it's, I don't even, like, how do you even make mayonnaise? Like, does anyone even do that anymore? You know, you go buy a jar of praise or something. But then we found out well, how easy it is to actually make, and it's like a mixture of like, you know, vinegar, um, egg, and something else. I can't remember now. And, and you just whisk it together. You can even use like an electric whisker and then you've made like a whole jar of mayonnaise and it's, it's healthier for you. You know exactly what goes into it. There's no preservatives. There's no artificial flavors, artificial colors. Um, and that's one thing you have to worry about nowadays with even certified organic because if you actually look up the actual um, uh, certification for certified organic, you can have things that are made and have a small percentage of artificial things and they can still consider it organic because it's a certain percentage of the total amount of that product. And that's why sometimes when you buy certified organic things, it still says flavors. It still says, you know, natural flavors because the whole thing doesn't need to be um, necessarily organic for it to be certified organic. So it's always good to look, to look at the labeling and, you know, I'm sure there are laws about what they need to include on that label and, you know, are you, are you even being told the whole story, right? But if you make something from raw materials, if you make it from scratch and you know, you know exactly what is going into that, into that food. And this is um, one thing that the virtuous woman does. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Another thing I, I wanted to mention as well is one thing Elizabeth makes as well is like broth and stock. And, and that's another thing that I find, if you, were to, if you were cooking a recipe and the recipe said add some broth to it or add some stock to it, you'd usually just go buy ready-made stock. And, and one thing you have to be aware of when you go and buy stock is they're filled with like MSG and preservatives and all these things. And that's why it makes your food better. Yes, it's got some chicken stock in there or some beef stock in there. 
But generally what makes your food taste so good is the MSG and artificial flavors that are in it. Um, you guys have seen those little chicken cubes. You know, you go to the store, you buy those little stock cubes. You gotta be careful what's in that stuff. A lot of that stuff is just artificial flavoring and, and MSG. MSG is like this artificial salt. It just tastes really good and they have to use a little amount. And you know, Chinese people would make it, you know, put it in their food and they became very famous. You know, you eat Chinese food, you gotta be aware of all the MSGs that they put in it. Uh, but you know, Elizabeth now is great. Actually, you know, we buy like these grass fed bones from grub and then, you know, she makes it from scratch now and it's, then she knows when she puts broth into all the different, different foods, she knows what's in it. Um, so you see here this virtuous woman, she's finding ways to add value using her skills, right? Because she's using her own hands. So there's, there's skills that she has and she takes these raw materials and she's able to add value there. But we see here as well that the virtuous woman, she's happy to get her hands dirty, right? She's working willingly with her hands. It's not that she's just working with her hands because she has to and it's a drag for her. She's happy to get in there. She's happy to get in there, you know, make the food or, you know, get into the garden, get her, get her hands dirty working with her hands. And you would think if there's a woman that is willing to work with her hands, she probably is not so concerned about the state of her nails, right? Or the state of her hands. She's probably got, like a virtuous woman probably has rough hands. You know, probably doesn't, probably keeps her nails short because it's not practical for the virtuous woman to have these nice, long, you know, uh, you know painted nails because when you need to use your hands, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle. I know even like uh, my, my dad's wife, she struggles keeping her nails in, in well because she works with her hands. She's always cooking, she's always doing things. Um, so it's really difficult for her to keep her nails like nice and long and, and painted. But one thing we see from the virtuous woman is that she's a really hard worker. I mean, that's what I was saying last week, like women will read through Proverbs 31 and it's almost an impossible standard. I mean, it, it makes you think, is, is, this, is Proverbs 31 even talking about the one woman, right? I mean, you kind of think, you read Proverbs 31, you know, and I, I probably assume this too, it's probably just talking about the concept of a virtuous woman. Was there really a woman that worked this hard? But, uh, you know, we see in Ruth that this woman was recognized as a virtuous woman. We see in uh, Ruth 3.11, uh, where the people are talking about her and it says here, and now my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. So I suppose it is a possible standard if Ruth was recognized as a virtuous woman and they knew this is what a virtuous woman was. Uh, I want to show you these verses in Ruth 2. Just to show you how hard working Ruth was. If you remember Ruth's story, you know, they, they didn't have a lot of money and she would go and glean after the reapers. So what, what was happening was Boaz, you know, he would own a field. They would go out picking all the corn and everything. And they may not you know, pick everything off the plant or they might be picking it and some of it would fall on the ground. And then the people that were poor, what they would do is then pick what was left. And one of the commandments in the Bible, in the Old Testament, was that you didn't glean over your field twice. You just went over it once and then whatever was left, the poor could come and pick from that and pick up what was uh, dropped on the ground. And look at what it says here. So Ruth was doing that. Um, it says here, Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she, and she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. So look at this, this woman, she's working willingly with her hands and she's even working from the morning until evening, gathering those, uh, you know, those sheaves as, they're, um, uh, as the reapers are going. And we read further down in verse 17, we see what Boaz did for Ruth. Um, Oh, oh no, I just wanted to show you here. So what, so what Boaz did for Ruth, Ruth is he basically told the reapers, you know, when, you, when you're gleaning, just drop a bit extra on the ground so that, you know, she's still picking them up, but she has more to pick up. So he was kind of looking out for her there, but not making it obvious. Verse 17 says here, so she gleaned in the field until even. So you see she's working from morning till night, picking up, you know, what she can to bring home for her family. 
and beat out that she had gleaned. So not only is she picking it up in the field, but she's preparing it as well, you know, as they would beat it out in, in order, I guess, to, to separate the, the grains from, from, the, from the cob, I'm, I'm thinking. And it was about an ephah of barley. So you can see how much work it took just to get one ephah of barley. And, and this is the example of a virtuous woman in the Bible, is Ruth. Uh, let's go back to Proverbs 31. So she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So what are a couple of thoughts on these verses? So one thing the virtuous woman is doing is she's looking for ways to save money. That's what I think when I think of she is like the merchant ship that bringeth her food from afar. Because sometimes you have to go further to get a discount, right? Sometimes you have to buy more from further away to get something cheap. I think of in our day and age today, the woman that's not seeking things from afar, like the merchant ship, bringing her food from far away, trying to save money, is like the woman that just goes down, you know, she, she's not prepared, right? She's not organized. So she's always going down to the corner store, just picking up the milk, picking up things that are more expensive, right? Because she's not, uh, you know, thinking about these things. She's not looking for ways to save money in her house, buying in bulk. So she's always going to what's convenient because she's unprepared and unorganized in, in those areas. And I remember when we were in Mexico, it's not so much here because, you, you know, everyone's got a car, you can drive down to Coles or whatever and get something. But in Mexico, there's always like these corner shops. Everyone owns like these convenience stores. And it's always more expensive at these shops than being able to travel a bit further to the local grocery store. But even in Australia, even in Sydney, if you can prepare your budget, you can be organized, you can actually buy things from bulk stores. You know, like we, we do like the group buy from honest to goodness. And buying things in bulk, if you're prepared and you seek those things out, you can save your household a lot of money. You not only save money, but you save time as well. Because it takes time to go to the shops. And you go to the shops, there's, there's less time in the day that you can spend taking care of your house. Um, so she's looking for ways to save money. But one thing I think as well when she's like the merchant ships, it's like there's some variety in her, in her menu, right? There's some variety in her, in her foods and flavors. She's not just cooking the same thing for her house every day. That's what I think. Um, you know, the merchant ships bringing these different spices um, and, and she makes things interesting for her family. And she's uh, thinking about how she can she please them in the way she's um, doing things around the house. Um, another thing I'm thinking as well when it says she's like the merchant ships in the sense that she is bringing food. She bringeth her food from afar. And when I read that, I think she's somebody that is delivering food to people as well. You know, and we sometimes do that as a church where the ladies will make food for other people and bring it to them to help them out. So she cooks and delivers food to other people. And again, making her own food. Um, you can save money rather than just having to buy food for people. If you make it yourself, you can save some money there. Because if you want to actually eat healthy food, eat premium foods, it's always going to be cheaper if you make it yourself. Right, because you can buy cheap things from the store, cheap things from Coles and Woolies, but generally those things are you know, devoid of nutrients. They're, they're not very good. They have like preservatives and things like that. And, and that's where you can eat on the cheap. But if you want to actually eat good, fresh, healthy food, it, it does, if you're going to buy like that organic prepared food, like in America, I, I don't really do it here, but I'm not sure what the stores are here, but in America, um, because I didn't cook, right? I would just go to the Trader Joe's or the Whole Foods and they're, they're like these organic grocery stores. And if you go to places like that in Sydney, you'll spend a lot of money buying organic you know, food or organic things from the freezer or whatnot. So you need to make it yourself if you're gonna save money in those ways. So making your own food can save money if you're buying healthy and premium foods. But not only that, in Proverbs 31.15, it says, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So this picture I get is she's rising up before the sun even comes up. And why? Because I'm thinking in those days, you know, people are productive when the sun is up. 
you know, we live in a technological world, you know, where, you know, we're not using candles that, you know, burns up resources. We've got all this electricity, we can turn the lights on. So people can work later on in the day when the sun's already been up for a couple of hours. But if you think here, she's rising up before the sun even comes up. Maybe it's because she knows that her house is then going to get up when the sun is up and she doesn't want to eat into that time. So she gets up before even that to prepare breakfast and then they can get to work and, and, and utilize their, uh, the maximum part of that day. All right, let's go on. So that's verse 15. She, she riseth also while it is yet night. She's waking up early in the morning and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Verse 16. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. Um, yeah, it's verse 16. She, she considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. So a couple of thoughts on this verse. She looks for ways she can support the income of the house, right? Making decisions that gain money um, as opposed to only draining money. Uh, so it's not necessarily wrong for a, a, a wife to make money because sometimes, you know, we, we, yes, we do preach that a woman ought to keep the home and things like that, but it's not wrong for a woman to find ways to supplement the income of the household. And, you know, some people believe that Christians think that women should not work. But what, what are they thinking? You know, in the sense that they don't think being a wife and a mother is work. And we're already seeing here, you know, if you're going to work at home, you're going to take care of your family. That's hard work. And sometimes when you look at the world's philosophies and they say, oh, you know, women can't work. They just have to be at home. Are they thinking it's not work being at home? And even with you guys out, you know, if we're out in the, corp, uh, in the corporate world or out in the workforce, you talk to the women that have had children and are returning to it. What do they say? Oh, it's easier being at work, right? Because it was hard being at home. It was hard taking care of the children. They'd rather be at work and send them off to daycare because it was hard work. So on the one side, the world is saying the women don't work, they're just at home. But at the, on the other side of the spectrum, the world recognises that it's hard work to be a mother, that it's hard work to take care of the home, that the work never stops. You know, you wake up early, you've got work to do. Even till night, you've got work to do. Taking care of the family, it never ends. And you ask any of the mothers, you know, they work hard. They work hard to take care of that house and to take care of their family. And it's just ironic that the world says that. They, they, that they do not value mothers. They don't value motherhood, the contribution on one side, but on the other side they do because on Mother's Day they start praising their mothers, praising them for, for you know, the fact that they were always there for them, that they were at home, that they were working hard. Well, if, but if you want all women to go out and work into the workforce, you're not going to have a mother that you can praise that she was always there for you and things like that. So what does the world want? They, they don't know what they want. But we see here, you know, God's will is, um, you know, that the mother takes care of the home, but that doesn't necessarily mean she can't make an income. You know, some women are more talented than others, have more of a mindset, and they look at ways, you know, you're already looking at ways to save money for your house, but if there's a way that you can make money, even the virtuous woman, she's considering a field, so out in her day-to-day, -day, she's thinking, hey, this is actually a good value for money, buying this field, preparing it, and having, running this business, but not neglecting, you know, her home. So it's not wrong for a woman to make an income. You know, as long as her responsibilities in the home are not neglected. It's not, even a, it's not even a sin necessarily for a woman to have a job. I just think it's not wise. Because if a woman has a job, it's different to running your own business. Because when you're running your own business, you are the boss, right? And then you, as the boss of your business, can still answer to your boss, your husband. And then your husband obviously answers to God. Whereas when you have a job, you have, a, you, you have given away time now. You're trading time for money and you're now stuck. So that's why, even though it's not necessarily a sin for a woman to have a job, in practicality, what happens is you sort of are tied to that job. You, you, know, you have obligations and you can't necessarily get away from, from the, that responsibility. So whilst it's not necessarily a sin for a woman to have a job, if she's got a lot of responsibilities at home, it's not always wise especially if you have children. Once you now have children, it would be even more unwise to have a job because you cannot, you know, you're spreading your, yourself too thin. So it's not necessarily a sin for a woman to make an income. It's not necessarily a sin for her to have a job. But if her responsibilities are at, at home are being neglected, you know, if your, if your house is not in order, 
um, you know, you're, you're struggling to support your husband in the things that he is trying to do because he needs support from you as well. You know, you're, you're not looking after your children. You know, you're dropping them off at daycares for other people to look after. Then you are neglecting your primary responsibilities, which is to be a support to your husband and to be a keeper at home. Um, so she, so it's not wrong necessarily to make money for the house. And a lot of uh, uh, stay-at-home moms do do this. They, a lot of the cloth diaper, you know, companies that online. They, these are all started by stay-at-home moms. Uh, I don't know if you know, like these stay-at-home moms, you know, because they're figuring out cloth diapers for their kids. So they think, well, I'm already buying it. You know, if I have a little bit of time on the side, you know, set up, set up an e-commerce site and just ship them from home. And, and nowadays you can hire couriers where they actually come and pick up stuff from your house. So if you're shipping enough parcels, you know, they come and pick it up from your house. You just prepare them all at home. They come and pick them up and deliver them and you're running your own business from home. Uh, just be it on the side rather than only being a financial drain on, on your household. Um, uh, where am I up to? Okay, verse 17. So she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. And we sort of saw that before where she's willing to work with her hands. You don't get this picture of the virtuous woman being like this knock over, the, knock over, knock, knock over by the wind sort of supermodel, right? You know, sometimes you see girls these days, they're so frail, they're so weak that they need, they need everything done for them, right? They, they can't help to take anything out of the car. If, if you need to move house, like they can't help because they don't have any strength. They're just like this sort of supermodel mentality that they, and they're just starving themselves to stay thin, that they don't have any strength in their arms. So she's, girdeth, she's girding her loins with strength. So her core muscles, right, are strong and her arms are strong as well. So this is not a weak woman that we're looking at, the virtuous woman. This is a strong woman, both mentally and physically. Um, so she's not scared of manual work. And, you know, it's, it's like I've said this before, you know, like baby changing, you know, is not only a woman's job, right? Like men should help take care of the, the, the kids. You know, I try and help, you know, where I can as well, like changing their diapers and bathing them and brushing their teeth and things like that. So that's not only a woman's job, but likewise the other way, like handyman things around the job, uh, around the house are not only a man's job. You know, you don't have to wait for your husband to come home to change the light bulb. You know, like you can, you can get in there and do it yourself, right? It's like just these things like that. Like if you need to like drill a hole and fix something, I mean, you don't have to wait for your husband to get home. I mean, a virtuous woman, she's going to go to her loins and strengthen her arms and get into it. And then sometimes Elizabeth does that. Like, you know, you, you generally think, um, you know, mowing the lawn, right? Mowing the lawn is like a man's job, right? And men get home or whatever, and then they mow the lawn on the weekend. But sometimes Elizabeth, she'll break out the lawnmower and then she'll go and mow the lawn. I mean, that's a great thing, right? That she's strengthening her arms. She's not scared to get her arms, her, her hands dirty and, and go out there and do some manual labor. And that's one thing I want to encourage the other women of this church as well, is that, you know, yes, there are things that might maybe primarily that men are known to do, but the virtuous woman can get it done too. You know, she's not worried about doing these things. Um, and not just saying, oh, that's a man's job because I don't want to get my hands dirty. So women can do handyman jobs around the house. Um, but also that, like, she's strengthening her arms. You can see that she's exercising. She's, she's staying fit, right? She's not just this weak woman. She does strengthen her arms. And back then, it might be a lot easier because there's a lot of manual labor. But we live in a day and age where we have a lot of efficiencies, right? Like we talked about, we love machines do a lot of the manual labor for us now. You're not going to be necessarily whisking something by hand if you've got, you know, the kitchen aid doing it for you. So you've got all these efficiencies. You can't let your body slip and just get weak, right? The virtuous woman takes care of her body and strengthens her body. She exercises and keeps her muscle mass up. And that's really important when you, you are trying to stay, you know, keep your weight in check. Uh, one thing I've always learned, uh, I learned when, uh, you know, looking up health things, uh, one mantra that's always stated is, you know, muscle dictates metabolism. If you want a high metabolism, your metabolism is going to burn off fat. You know, you're eating regularly, eating the right food, but you also need enough muscle mass that your muscles are then, you know, because your muscles require energy to exist. Whereas fat doesn't. Fat is like a storage. 
So if you can start building up your muscle mass, your muscles will then start eating in to that fat content and then you can um, get your weight under control. Um, so preg pregnancy again. You know, pregnancy is not an excuse to be lazy and eat badly. You know, it's like men. If, if a man has a placid job, if you don't have a tradey type job where you're working physically hard and actually you know, using your muscles, you need to also take time to exercise. You know, don't just let yourself go and then, you know, get the belly and get fat and things like that. And you see a lot of preachers these days, like preachers, you know, they talk about, you know, taking care of their body, not smoking and drinking, but a lot of them are overweight. I mean, we met one today, Michael, right? Like a pastor of a church that was overweight. So men as well, if you have a placid job living in a technological world, you know, with these efficiencies, we also need to take that time, you know, get a hobby or something that makes you actually use your body or do a bit of exercise. It doesn't really take that much to keep your muscle mass up. And I, I'm even seeing this myself because, you know, I, I've always had an active job and I've always done a sport. That's partly why I started playing soccer with some of the guys from church because I just, for years, I wasn't doing anything and I was just thinking, oh, you know, I think I'm just like living off my past like fact that I used to always do a sport and I've always been thin and had a high metabolism. Um, but then when I started going up a few pants, I was I'm like, okay, I better start like doing something, right? So we started playing soccer, but then I found it even in my own life, I've started doing some pull-ups, starting doing some push-ups just to try and get my muscle mass up. And I find it doesn't even really take that long. Like I can do a couple of reps of push-ups and it takes me like 10 or 15 minutes. And I've just been doing it like every second day, every third day, just sort of rotating with pull-ups and push-ups. And I'm actually starting to see some results. I think my, my arms are getting strong. I'm able to do more. And it didn't even take that long. So these ads, you remember you used to look at these ads on TV and it's like 10 to 15 minutes a day of this ab roller and you'll start to see a difference. They're actually, it's actually right. It's just, <laughs> you know, you actually just do a little bit a day, you actually start to see a difference and you, you, your arms start to strengthen. So it doesn't take a lot, you know. In order, to, in order to keep yourself healthy. And the virtuous woman is the same. She's strengthening her loins. She's strengthening her arms. Um, and like I said, pre don't use pregnancy as an excuse either. You know, like a lot of women, they, they get pregnant and then they get placid. You know, they, everything is done for them. And we as a culture as well have this mindset that when a woman is pregnant, it's like, oh, don't let her carry anything. Don't let her do anything. No, you just sit, you just relax, you're pregnant. No, no, no. You know, they need to be active as well. Yes, you're not gonna, you're not gonna overstrain them. You know, you're not gonna get them to do, like lift really heavy things, but they need to be active. They still need to be exercising as well, even when you're pregnant, so that you um, don't get placid and then your muscle doesn't start deteriorating, turn into fat. All right, let's go on to verse 18. So she strengthens her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. Now, this is one thing about running a business, right? Remember how she considers a field and she buys it and she, she, work, she, develops, she plants a vineyard and sells that fruit. What I see in this verse is that the virtuous woman, she has some business sense, right? She's not just buying a field at, a, like, at an exorbitant value and then make the money doesn't even like, you know, she's she planting a vineyard, you know, things are neglected and then the fruit she sells doesn't even make up the cost or the expense of, of, of maintaining that field. So she says, she perceived it that her merchandise is good. What I see from that is she's making something that the market actually wants. She's actually making money for the family because a lot of women, um, and I'm just generalizing just from people I, I know and have seen, Sometimes, sometimes housewives and women where, you know, they're not the main breadwinner, right? They want to just do something as a hobby. But what ends up happening is, it, is the husband ends up paying for that hobby. Like they want to start their own business, right? So they go out and do something. But they're not actually making more than it costs to actually run that business. And then the husband has to end up offsetting that business. You know, so it's actually just draining money from the family. But she feels good because, you know, she's made these things. It's cost her $100. She sold them for $50. She feels like, oh, somebody's buying things from me. But she didn't actually make any money. So the virtuous woman's not like that. The virtuous woman, she perceives that her merchandise is good. Like she, she knows that she's, what she's making is actually going to make some money rather than her just wasting her time, you know, doing something that is just draining money from the family. So you want to have some business sense as a, as a virtuous woman. Um, and she's going to try and support the income. Um, don't just do things naively, ignorantly, just because you, you, you like the glamour of having your own business but not actually making any money from it. So not just doing like a hobby business, 
but actually having a viable product. And you see here, her, her candle goeth not out by night. This virtuous woman, like I said, she's, she's a hard worker. She's working early in the morning and she's working late at night. And you know, the thought I had was, like, when does this woman get me sleep? You know, she's working really early, she's working really late. But then, then I figured it out. It's because she's napping during the day, <laughs> right? She, she's waking up in the morning to prepare stuff for her house, you know, and then her husband goes to work. And then she has a bit of a siesta in the afternoon and then comes home and she's working late at night. It's like, do you ever sleep? But no, she's, she's sleeping during the day. It's fine, you know. It's, it's probably, she's working around the schedule of her house, you know. She's, she's looking out for them. So, um, so she, she perceived that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. So she's actually getting involved in this business, right? And she has some skills. <clears throat> Let's go on. So she stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. So this one is an, an obvious one, an attribute of a virtuous person, is they're taking care of those that are in need, right? They're considerate of the less fortunate less fortunate. They're not blind to these things. Um, so it's back to, you know, the making food and the delivering, um, you know, looking out for those that are needy. But, you know, one thing I, I thought of here is the virtuous woman reaches out to the poor, right? She reacheth forth her hands to the needy. So yes, it's not just about, hey, you know, I, I'm helping those in need, but she actually has her eyes open seeing people that have need. So you're not waiting to be asked, right? Because sometimes we think of the needy as people outside of church, but sometimes they're here right under your noses. But then you're just, you just don't have your eyes open knowing that they have a need. And you don't wait to be asked. You're like, oh yeah, well, they're in need, but if they need something, they'll ask me for it. The virtuous woman reaches forth her hands to the needy. She's the one that realizes maybe they need some help and offers and reaches out to them. Um, so she's not too proud to offer help. Because sometimes in our culture, we're too proud to offer help because we don't want to be rejected. So it's a little bit self-centered, it's a bit selfish and proud. But if you see somebody in need, it's, it's good to reach out to them, right? And to, to see whether they need some help and, um, and, and be aware of that, especially in the house of God, especially in this church. So she's not too proud to offer help in fear of being rejected. And she's aware of the struggles that people may have, even without being told. And you know what that requires if you want to be aware of people's struggles? It means you've got to get to know them, right? You've got to get to know people in your church. You've got to talk to them, get to know them. And then that way you can know what they're struggling with and help them if they need help. You also won't be too scared or too, it won't be so daunting to offer them help if you have a good relationship with them. All right, let's go on to verse 29. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. So we see here that the virtuous woman, right, she's planning ahead. She's not afraid when winter comes because she's already thought about that. It's not that winter comes, right, and now she's got to go out and buy all the expensive winter gear that just came out because the new season's on. She's thinking... Hey, well, winter comes just like it does every year. Hey, the winter clothes are on special. Why don't I buy them now so that when the snow comes, my house is clothed? Whereas back then, you know, she would be making it. It would be summer and she's making clothes ready for when winter hits so that when her household is cold, they are, they are clothed. Um, and she's also, you know, she, she can get some nice things herself. So it's not that the virtuous woman is just devoid of nice things. I mean, she's got some nice clothing as well. Her clothing is made of silk and purple. So it's not, it's not necessarily you can't have nice things as, as a virtuous woman. Um, but one thing you know here is that she's covered, right? It's coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. So she's making herself clothes or buying herself clothes where she is covered up because obviously a virtuous woman is not one that is out there to be immodest and showing off her body. So she plans ahead, getting winter clothes in summer and vice versa. Um, doesn't mean you can't have some decent quality clothes like silk and purple, but, but she's covered. Um, you know, that's one thing we do. It's like when we go to the Anglicare warehouse, the Anglicare warehouse is this place where people donate all their clothes. 
And generally you'll go there and it, you know, in summer it's all like the, the winter clothes that people are throwing out and in winter it's all the summer clothes that people are throwing out. So you've got to sort of plan ahead and think, well, do I, can I, should I pick up some jumpers and things now in summer so that when winter comes, my, my, my children have the appropriate clothes. Uh, okay, let's go on. Verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Now, two thoughts on this verse about the husband being known in the gates. If you're familiar in the Bible, the gates is where generally the leaders of the community would sit. Remember, Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and that was a bad thing because he was like a leader of Sodom, and Sodom was a, a really wicked city. Um, uh, but the gates is generally where the leaders would sit, where the elders of that city would sit. And he's saying here, her husband is somebody that is respected in that community. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a leader. Uh, so one thing is, one thought is in Proverbs 12, 12 verse 4, where we see a proverb about a virtuous woman. It says here, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. So we see here, if a wife... Or even a daughter, you know, a daughter, a wife, um, a mother. If she's a virtuous woman, in this, in this case it's talking about the virtuous woman being the wife, it's a crown to her husband. Why? Because it, it makes her husband look better than he really is. It's one of those things. If a woman respects her husband, is submissive to her husband, and is a virtuous woman, you know what? People, people will think more highly of the husband than he really is. It's just one of those things. It's like if, you have, if, you, if your wife is like that, they think that you've got everything in order. That you, but sometimes it's just that your wife is just like that. Your wife fears God and she wants to do the right thing and she's trying to please Jesus Christ, but it, it makes you look better than you, you, you actually from your own works. So that's one thing where her, her husband is known in the gates. It could be that you know, she, the virtuous woman makes her husband look better than he really is just on his own. Um, when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Or there's another thought, the flip side of it, is that the husband of the virtuous woman is somebody that is worth respecting and that's why she is a virtuous woman, you know, in, in the sense that he is encouraging her to be a virtuous woman. So sometimes, you know, a husband will be reading Proverbs 31 and thinking, well, you know, come on, Christian wife, like why aren't you more of a Proverbs 31 virtuous woman? But then the, pro the, the husband of the virtuous woman is somebody that is a strong leader. He's known in the gates. He's respected in his community. He's somebody that's, that's respectable, that's easy to follow. So if you want your wife to be a Proverbs 31 woman, then be, be the Proverbs 31 husband, right? That is known in the gates, that is respected, that is leading his family. Then, you know, you may encourage your wife to be more like this woman in Proverbs 31. So the success of your husband can be affected by how you respect and support him. But also the husband of this virtuous woman is actually someone that's respectable and a leader. So it's, there's both sides of the coin here that can balance the scales and move the relationship in the right direction. And men, you know, we have a big influence on whether our wife is a virtuous woman, you know, in the terms of how we are. So the question is, are you a virtuous man? Because we talked about Remember, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? It's interesting, if you look up the phrase, who can find, you know what you, else you find? I don't know if you've seen this verse before. Oh, it's 26. It says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. So everyone, is, everyone talks about how good they are. But a faithful man, who can find? So not only is a virtuous woman rare, but a faithful man is rare as well. And I don't think there's really much difference between a faithful man or a virtuous woman, because if you're, if you're a virtuous person, then you're faithful. And likewise, if you're a faithful person, you're virtuous. So it's just these people, people, everyone talks about what they do, everyone talks about what they're going to do, but the people that actually do it and are faithful in doing it are very rare. That's why the virtuous woman is rare. That's why the faithful man is rare. Uh, let's go on, Proverbs 31. She maketh fine linen, and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honour are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. 
And I sort of touched on this before, but you know, submissive doesn't mean you need to be, you doesn't mean you need to be weak, right? Yes, the Proverbs 31 woman is a submissive woman. She's a submissive wife to her husband. Her heart, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her, but she's not physically weak either. And strength and honour are her clothing. So I find that she's not mentally weak either. So submissive doesn't mean you need to be weak. When you're meek, meekness is not necessarily weakness, Right? Meekness is not weakness. Just because you are submissive and meek doesn't mean that you're necessarily weak. It's knowing your role in the family, right? You know your role in the family, um, like God has commanded. I want to show you this uh, verse in Philippians 2, verse 3. Because one thing about submit, submitting is that it takes, it's, it's, it's sort of like an oxymoron because it actually takes strength to submit, in the sense that if, in order for you to submit to somebody, it takes strength. Why? Because you have to refrain from using the strength that you do have. Um, and we see this in Jesus Christ, where he was equal with God. Let, not, let, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So you see, it's natural to look after your own things, but it actually takes some strength, some spiritual sp strength to deny yourself and look after others. Verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So you see that Jesus Christ, he acknowledged that he was equal with God. But what, he, what did he do? But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus Christ is our example of meekness and him being equal with God. So as a wife, as a virtuous woman, you may think, hey, well, I, am, I can do this better than my husband. I'm a better leader than my husband. But meekness means you know your position in the family that you are to be the follower and the supporter and the strength you have is the strength to submit to your husband and obey the will of God and have your house in order um, and, be, and have your relationship pleasing to God. So when you see strength and honour are her clothing, that is what's seen. Right? If you think about what, the clothing that you wear, that's how you uh, appear to the outside world. So how does a virtuous woman look to people? Does she look weak, mentally weak, spiritually weak? No. Strength and honour are her clothing. You look at a virtuous woman, you think this is a strong woman. But that doesn't mean she's not a submissive woman. Right? Because when I see a woman that is bossing her husband around, she's loud mouthed, she's not meek and quiet like the Bible says, that's a weak woman. Right? Because she's, she's spiritually weak. Because a spiritually strong woman is walking in, 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 the, in the spirit right? and obeying God. So those that are obeying God and they are that ornament of a meek and quiet spirit like we read in Peter, then they are those that have honour and strength as their clothing. Um, she shall rejoice in time to come. Hmm. Uh, Verse 26, let's go on. She openeth her mouth with, with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. So we see it's not just what a woman says, right? Because she's opening her mouth with wisdom, but it says here, in her tongue is the law of kindness. So it's not just what you say, it's also how you say it. Um, we see that in Ephesians 4. We'll just, uh, we'll just go there quickly. It says here, um, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So this is, there's this idea in the Bible where it's not just what we say, but it's how we say it. And same with the virtuous woman. She doesn't just open her mouth with wisdom, but she also opens her mouth with kindness. So she says the right things the right way. Um, I'll show you, we, we sort of alluded to this verse in 1 Peter 3, where it says here, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, 
that if any obey not the word, that they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So we see here that when you're trying to influence your husband, sometimes the way you act, not your conversation in the Bible is your lifestyle, not, not the, the things that you're saying in, in the King James Bible. So your conversation, the way you behave, your lifestyle, that has a greater impact on your husband than even the words that you speak. Verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear. What, with the fear, fear of the husband? No, with the fear of God, right? Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on a, of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So isn't it interesting that the, 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 the wife, a godly wife, and you know, by extension, a virtuous woman, right? She's described as being an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Meek and quiet. So if you're known to be a loud person, if you're known to be, you know, you enter the room and everyone knows you're there, you know, you're, you're shouting across the room and things like that, this is not the, the ornament that God would want you to be. He wants you to be uh, known as meek and quiet. Now, are, are there times when you need to be loud? Yes, right? But this is, this is I think, as a, general, as a general picture, when you think of the virtuous woman, what do you think? Do you think of somebody that is meek and quiet? Or do you think of somebody that's loud and boisterous, that's proud and boisterous? All right, let's go back to Proverbs 31. So she opens her mouth with wisdom. So not only that, she's considering what she says, right? She's not just opening her mouth. And, this is, and these are principles for any Christian, right? We think about what we say so that when we open our mouths, we're opening our mouths with wisdom. In her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. So you see here that the virtuous woman, you know, this is why she's a keeper at home, because she's looking after, she's looking out for her household first and foremost. She's making decisions based on what's best for her family, not, not what's best for her business or for her job. Because she, she, first and foremost, she should be looking out for those in her house. And one way she does that, it says here, she eateth not the bread of idleness. And this is one thing, even myself, you know, she's not lazy. She's not just sitting around doing nothing. And it's so easy to do that in our day and age. Why? Because you've got social media, right? You've got YouTube, you've got Facebook, you've got an endless amount of things that you could be reading and entertaining you, you know, especially if you've got a TV in the house and you've just got it on, just sitting there for hours, just doing nothing. This is what the virtuous woman doesn't do. She doesn't waste her time. But, and think about this, the picture of eating the bread of idleness, it's that you're doing something, but it's still wasting your time because you think you're eating bread. It actually requires energy, right? It actually requires some exertion where you're actually eating something, but it's not profiting you. You're actually doing something and, and not doing anything at the same time. This is what the virtuous woman doesn't do. So she doesn't waste her time uh, unnecessarily uh, you know, on social media and things like that. And we, we all do that. Um, we waste our time, we neglect our responsibilities because we've got too much in this life these days to entertain us. Um, and my wife uh, pointed out this funny, uh, this funny uh, picture on, on Facebook once saying um, this woman at home, she's like you know, writing a blog or she's writing a status update and her children are calling for her. She's like, wait a second, let me tell everyone how much I love you. You know, because you know on Facebook, everyone's always telling you, you know, how much they do for their kids and how much, you know, how much they love, how much they do at home. Whereas there's an immediate need right there and she's like trying to post, um, write a post on Facebook. <clears throat> so she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Now, when I think of, when I read verse 29, um, I don't know if this is the actual uh, person writing the prophet, the Holy Spirit, just stating another thing about the virtuous woman. I think it's the actual praise from the husband and her children. So if you, if you read it that way, like her children are rising up, calling her blessed. Her husband's praising her. And the way I sort of look at this is maybe this is what the husband is saying. is saying, hey, 
many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all, in the sense that being a mum is a work that's not necessarily public. People don't know how much work you do at home, but generally your family does, and as your family grows up, they'll appreciate the work that you do at home, and they're the ones that are going to be praising you. Um, you know, the world may not praise you for the things you do at home because they don't know, but your family will know, your husband does know. And if, you, if you're a husband and you don't appreciate the things your wife does at home, you know, you, shame on you. You ought to reflect on that. You know, I, I thank God for Elizabeth. Like, there is a lot of things that I can't do without Elizabeth. Like you, and, and often the person, you know, as a bishop of this church, people think, you know, generally you're the one getting the praise. You think, oh, you know, Victor's such a hard worker. Victor does all this. But you don't realize that it's me and Elizabeth because we have a family. We are both running this church. There are things that I can only do because Elizabeth's got things handled at home. Sometimes I come late back from soul winning. And if Elizabeth has everything ready, then we can get to church on time. So there's a lot of things that Elizabeth does in the background, but generally is not known, but is known to her family as our children grow up. But it's, you know, it's definitely recognized by me. Um, and it's the same in your family. You want, you don't necessarily, you're not seeking necessarily the praise of the world in what you do, but you do, but, it, but it's good. Um, your family will recognize the things that you do um, if you are being a virtuous woman. So being a mum, you know, it's a work that's not public. If you do it well, sometimes you're only be recognized by your family. God obviously recognizes the work that you do. Um, and, you know, men, don't forget the vital role that your wife plays. You know, like, like I said, I can't do a lot of the things I do without my wife. Um, and, and when I think here where, where the husband is praising his wife and saying, you know, many daughters have done virtuously, saying, hey, a lot of women out there are doing the right thing. But you see, like, he is appreciative of her. He's saying, but you're better than all of them. It's almost like that the husband, you're irreplaceable to your husband. He wouldn't want anybody else. And at the same time, like, I want to be irreplaceable to my, to my wife. She might think, hey, you know, a lot of men work hard and a lot of men look after their wives, but, you know, you're better than all of them. That's what I want my wife to think about me as well. That's what I should be striving for. And as a virtuous woman, you want to be striving for that praise as well from your family that they know that you, they don't, they don't wouldn't want another mother, right? They wouldn't want somebody else. Um, verse 20, many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. And we're on the last two verses. Verse 30, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gate. So we already sort of touched on verse 31, where it's going to be your works that praise you, right? It's going to be your works that really is going to speak volumes. And it's not these things. Look at verse 30. Favor is deceitful. So favor is like, gr like grace in people's eyes. I sort of think of this when it's saying favor is deceitful. It's like popularity, right? It's so somebody that every, 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 she's popular, but is, is that what you're striving for? No. You're striving to be a woman that fears the Lord. That's what ultimately concludes what a virtuous woman is. She's a woman that fears the Lord. That's why she works hard. That's why she respects her husband and submits to her husband. That's why she's doing all these things, because she wants to ultimately please God. So we see here, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. Why? Because favor, if you're popular, that doesn't earn you any eternal rewards, right? You can be the most popular person in the world, but is that going to earn you anything in eternity? No, your works is what is going to earn you things in eternity. Um, same with beauty. You know, it says beauty is vain. Yeah, beauty may help you to attract a husband, but what does beauty do for you in the terms of e e eternity? You know, beauty is gone in a couple of years. You know, it's gone, you know, in, you know, let's say you're beautiful now, but in 10 years time, are you going to be beautiful still? In, in, in 20 years time, is your beauty going to remain? No. So beauty does not profit you anything in eternity. So this is not where you want to be spending a lot of your time in just becoming beautiful and, and being popular. What you want to be is a woman that fears the Lord. Because when you fear the Lord, you'll do the works, you'll, you'll, then you'll actually have a reward in eternity. 
Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. So again, coming back to that meek and quiet spirit, the virtuous woman doesn't need to praise herself. She doesn't need to tell everybody how hard she works or how, how much she does because her own conversation, her own lifestyle, her own works are going to be what people know. So anyways, I hope that, um, I'll, I'll end it there, but I hope that gave you some more information, some practical applications on being a virtuous woman. Um, you know, I hope the women in this church, you know, you know, and even the young women in this church, and, and even our daughters, you know, my daughter's asleep right now, but I'll have this chat with her again when she gets older. <laughs> you know, that we, you strive to be this virtuous woman, that you don't just strive to be popular, and especially, you know, for, for girls as they go through school, they have like adolescent, you know, um, friends, sometimes they just strive to be popular amongst their friends. They just, they just want to be beautiful and, and, and you know, want men to be attracted to them. Uh, but that's not what you're striving for. You're striving to be a woman that fears the Lord. And it's great that you have this example that you can follow. You can read through this and you can, re you can reflect, is this, is this what people will think of me when they think of who I am? Do they think of Proverbs 31 or do they think I'm loud, I'm lazy, I don't fear the Lord, all I care about is my looks and my clothing and my hair? That's not what I would want to, to do if I was a Christian woman. I would want to um, be a woman that fears the Lord and is seeking praise in the right areas and not the wrong areas. All right, anyways, let's, uh, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you for the many... Um, tips and many uh, advice and wisdom we can get from Proverbs. Um, we just pray, Lord, that you'd help uh, this church and the families in this church. Help us, Lord, as parents um, to, to raise our children, to be uh, you know, faithful men and virtuous women. Help us, Lord, to be faithful men and virtuous women. Help us be the change that we want to see in the world. And I uh, pray, Lord, that you just give us your grace. Lord, we're not perfect. Uh, Lord, you know, and, and even myself, you know, I, I preach on these passages, Lord, and, and some of them are really convicting. Um, pray, Lord, that, you know, we would not go home the same people we came. And Lord, we would just reflect on the sort of person that you want us to be. Uh, and Lord, that we would fear you. Um, the conclusion of the whole matter is to, to fear you and keep your commandments. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to do that. Um, so thank you, Lord. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.